Congo is like a nightmare in heaven. It's a heaven because, you know, Congo is the heart of Africa. So much natural resources, the people, uh, the animals, uh, the flowers, uh, everything, you know. Congo is heaven, but the thing is that people are living like in hell. People are dying. At first, we used to hear one million people die, two, three, four, five. And the situation is getting worse, worse and worse, you know, because the money is, the money is there, the resources are out there in Congo, and everybody wants a piece of Congo. Everybody wants a piece of Congo. Why are people living hand to mouth in one of the most mineral rich countries in the world? The Congo produces more than a billion dollars of gold alone each year. And the cobalt and the tin and the copper and the tungsten, all of that we're benefiting from, but yet we're silent. When people invade your country, they rape your women, they rape the kids, they morally control your mind. There's a pattern to genocide. You can see it coming, I mean, it's like a hurricane. Are we gonna have to wait for 20 more years before somebody does something to stop this Holocaust? There's a global consensus that exists that says it's okay for nearly six million black people to die in the heart of Africa and for us to be silent. So I kept asking our intelligence people, is there any truth to this? I mean, what's happening out there? I don't think policymakers could claim that they didn't know. There's something wrong. There's something wrong with us in terms of the way we think about Africa. The story of Congo is often overlooked for its complexity. It's a story where boundaries are porous and national identities mean little. Militant groups with ever-changing acronyms are not who they claim to be, and neighbors loot and murder while they are praised by the international community. But the death toll is now surpassing that of the Holocaust, in part because of the way the United States is involved in Central Africa. Now facing a critical juncture in their history, the Congolese people need us to change the way we're involved so that they can have the space to start rebuilding their country. The first principle to understand about the Congo, the affairs of the Congo have not been determined by the people of the Congo. The national boundaries were formed at the Berlin Conference in 1885 when Congo was given to King Leopold II of Belgium as his own personal property. He owned it for 23 years and during that time made a huge fortune off the territory, estimated at well over a billion dollars in today's American dollars, primarily from turning people into forced laborers to gather ivory and then even more so wild rubber. As the Belgians were pursuing ivory and rubber, though, they discovered lots of gold deposits, diamonds, copper, cobalt, and many other minerals. So, since 1885, Congo has been caught in the midst of a geostrategic battle, um, primarily for her natural resources. Part of its ongoing conflict has been the desire by different armed groups and neighboring countries to benefit, to get rich, to make money from those particular minerals. These resources that are found in the Congo are vital to major industries in the West, whether we're talking about the automotive industry, aerospace industry, technology industry, the electronics industry, even the jewelry industry. These minerals exist in great profusion throughout the Democratic Republic of Congo, especially in its eastern part. And this is the largest territory on earth which really doesn't have a functioning government. Uh, people can say anything, but the Congo is still a police state. There is no freedom of the press. You hear people being killed. The army is not an army. 
you know, this is a bunch of uh, people who are indisciplined, uh, who still roam the streets. But all this 125 years must be taken into consideration to fully understand why Congo is in a weakened state today. If we look from 1885 to 1908, we're talking about personal rule, enslavement. From 1908 to 1960, colonialism, Congo under colonial rule. Congo finally elects its leader in 1960, and in 61 was assassinated, so we have assassination. Then a dictator was put over the people for another three decades, so now we have dictatorship. Then an invasion was backed from the outside with Rwanda and Uganda in 1996 that uh, Congolese people suffer from to this day. So we have 125 years of this. Now what that does is it destroys and eviscerate the Congolese institutions. And when you have great wealth, no government, it's an open invitation and it's been a sort of a free-for-all war as rival warlords surrounding African countries like Rwanda and Uganda in the East have just uh, gone in there and helped themselves to this enormous natural wealth. Since 1996, the conflict in Congo has claimed the lives of an estimated 6 million people. Today, neighboring governments continue plundering by using proxy forces to displace entire communities for access to the land. Scenes like this are often misunderstood as simply the result of an ethnic war, a mistake that only benefits those trying to hide their illegal exploits. It has nothing to do with ethnicity. They killed Congolese like they were flies. You see how people, you feel a mosquito and you just hit? That's exactly how they killed. It did not mean anything to them how they were killing the Congolese, as long as we can just wipe them out and get access. I mean, the, the mines exist. People used to live in those areas. Have we ever asked who was living where the mine was before? Did the mine just show up? No, there were villages where those mines were. From 1996 to the present, an estimated 6 million dead. Abject poverty. People living in bestial conditions. Hundreds of thousands of women systematically raped as a strategy of war. Rape happened to be one of the, the weapons that worked the most. Because as soon as you, you destabilize a community, you rape the the entire village, the women of the entire village, in front of the children, in front of the husband, in front of the neighbors, that community is broken completely. Because the men cannot look at the wives in the eye and, and, and say, we, didn't, we were unable to protect you. And the women cannot survive that trauma. Congo is one of the worst places in the world to be a woman or a girl. And one of my recent trips to Congo, I, I met up with a young girl who was 15 years old. She um, had been violently raped by one of the rebel groups, and she had been held for three months in a hole in the ground, in a pit, naked. And every day, another combatant would come and rape her. She was only 15. She realized at one stage that she had fallen pregnant. And then they killed her best friend who was in the pit with her. There were two of them. And she had to stay in that pit with the body for six weeks, unable to climb out of the pit, knowing that she was pregnant and still being raped day in, day out. Since 1996, hundreds of thousands of Congolese women and girls have been raped, and the violence is escalating. Their attackers are foreign or Congolese, the lines between them blurred by years of greed, chaos, and impunity. As the women are broken, so is the community, a war strategy that leaves tens of thousands of people dead every month. They reduce you to a non-human, in essence. 
people are being reduced to a non-human so that they cannot think. They can feel powerless. They can feel hopeless. So they can give up. Imagine, I mean, you may not even be able to put your uh, mind, wrap your mind around it, but imagine nearly six million people dying in the middle of Europe, and yet we're silent. Millions of Congolese people have lost their life as a result of the crises that we've been discussing, and it has warranted almost no sustained and enterprising reporting from the media of the world. It has obtained no great purchase on the popular imagination millions of people dead. Why is it that nobody's talking about it? This is the same international community that said, you know, when there was a, a holocaust, uh, that no more uh, genocide would take place, and yet the same community left Rwanda genocide take place, and uh, yet those who committed genocide in Rwanda crossed over in the Congo, and the Congo has become the victim, the victim of what happened in Rwanda, and, and what the international community didn't do to stop it. In 1994, the international community failed to stop the Rwandan genocide and effectively punish its perpetrators. Since then, violence in Central Africa has escalated, <coughs> along with a growing culture of impunity. If you don't hold to account those who carry out these horrible atrocities. It leaves the door open for them to do more. Free to flee the country, hundreds of militants crossed over into Congo for fear of retribution from the Tutsi-led rebellion that took power in Rwanda. The militants were hidden among millions of predominantly civilian Hutu refugees trying to escape the violence in their country. The refugee camps, which had over a million people in them, were being controlled by these very same genocidaire, these people who had committed the genocide. Paul Kagame, who led the Tutsi rebellion and was now in charge of Rwanda, saw these militant refugees as a threat to Rwandan national security. He came to Washington, D.C. and essentially said, if the international community is not going to do it, we're going to take things into our own hands. The U.S. had no official re response to that, which he interpreted as a green light. In the absence of justice, a terrifying cycle of revenge was about to take hold in Congo, as Paul Kagame's army prepared to massacre what many experts estimate to be hundreds of thousands of refugees. And reports started coming in about atrocities that had been committed, in which they had slaughtered thousands of Hutu civilians. Um, now, believe me, I have no sympathy whatsoever for these genocidaires, these uh, inter ahamwe guys who had, uh, you know, committed the genocide in Rwanda. But the civilians, obviously, the children, the women, are you kidding? Why, why would they be victimized by this? These Hutu were not combatants. They were not people under arms. They were elderly, they were women, they were children, they were sick people who were killed in a systematic and highly motivated way, and the UN knew about it almost in real time. The UN knew, the US government knew, I believe other governments knew as well. They did not make an effort to openly investigate those who were not good enough. They allowed investigations to be blocked and they didn't push it. Now the question can be asked, why was that the case? And of course, part of the difficulty here was that many Policymakers felt guilty. They hadn't done enough to stop the Rwandan genocide, and that genocide guilt allowed them to cover this up. That guilt manifested in the Clinton era in a extremely, extremely pro-Rwanda policy, which essentially allowed the new government in Rwanda to do whatever they wanted, both within their country and within Congo with impunity. With the leaders of the United States and the United Nations looking the other way, Kagame proceeded with a full-scale invasion of Congo with his Ugandan ally, Yoweri Museveni. So the question is, uh, what role did the U.S. play in this? And it was a pretty direct supporting role. I happened to go to Rwanda just before this invasion took place. and. You know, major shipments of weapons were coming in at night to support the Rwandan army. We had placed uh, people in the country who were training Rwandan army troops. 
Uh, and in, in short, we were supporting the invasion. The United States, what they decided to do in the final analysis was to support an invasion of the Congo. In this case, you had Rwanda and Uganda invading their neighbor, plundering it of its natural resource wealth, and suffering no sanctions at the United Nations Security Council. And you have to ask why, and it's because uh, they had the very strong support and backing of the United States, United Kingdom, and other governments. The reason the United States supported Rwanda and Uganda in their invasion of Congo cannot simply be attributed to genocide guilt. The U.S. had economic and political motivations as well. One reason for our involvement extended back to our support of Mobutu Sisi Seko, a dictator we helped install in Congo and supported for 32 years. This man bled his country dry. He extracted even more money from it than King Leopold did in his time, but Mobutu had a longer reign and a much more developed economy to plunder. And the United States was deeply complicit in that because we supported Mobutu lock, stock, and barrel. But after the Cold War ended, essentially in 1989, 1990, many of his backers, including the United States government and the French government, essentially abandoned him. Uh, he became a liability to them because he had such a bad human rights record. When Mobutu became an embarrassment, we helped Rwanda and Uganda overthrow him and install another dictator and another. Now the Congolese people are victims of a corrupt dictatorial network which receives financial support from the United States. They have looted the place outrageously, you know, taking hundreds of millions of dollars in minerals, sponsoring some of the worst warlords, and with never a protest from Washington. The role the U.S. plays in Central Africa is complex. Historically, we've maintained influence in the area for access to minerals on which our economy and military rely. But our connection to Rwanda serves our interests in yet another way. A problem here is really a problem of political will in the United States. Why is Rwanda and why are Uganda important to the U.S. military? Precisely because we can have them do things in Africa that we don't wish to do for ourselves. We can have their soldiers die if need be, we can have them deploy places if need be. And so having proxies, having allies, having clients who are willing to do your bidding becomes very important. The disciplined and organized armies of Rwanda and Uganda are useful for protecting American interests in Africa. Similarly, friendships with dictators are easier to manage than complex, thriving democracies. For generations, the way the United States has been involved in Central Africa has helped perpetuate tyranny and dependency. So, when you see these prescriptions coming out of Washington, then they say, well, we tried everything, you know, we support peacekeepers, we've had peace talks. And it's usually within the parameters of maintaining the current order. This has serious implications in terms of what people don't talk about, U.S. foreign policy. That's where the problem lies. He has something to do with the United States and Great Britain supporting strong men in Africa rather than supporting the people. Now, it's easy to point fingers and to pin the blame of these problems on others. Yes, a colonial map that made little sense helped to breed conflict. The West has often approached Africa as a patron or a source of resources rather than a partner. But the West is not responsible for the destruction of the Zimbabwean economy over the last decade. Or wars in which children are enlisted as combatants. But now, Obama, when he went to Ghana, he had a huge speech. You know, that really woke up Africans. You know, it was very harsh. It was almost as a dad telling the kids, you guys need to get your act together. You know, you can't have election here and spring some elections there and call that democracy. That was good for him to say that. Saying that, you know, he's demanding that there, there are some accountability for political leaders in Africa. But he said something that still sticks with me today. 
is say that America is ready to support strong institutions, but not strong men. Africa, Africa doesn't need strong men. It needs strong institutions. As for America and the West, our commitment must be measured by more than just the dollars we spend. I've pledged substantial increases in our foreign assistance, which is in Africa's interests and America's interests. But the true sign of success is not whether we are a source of perpetual aid that helps people scrape by. It's whether we are partners in building the capacity for transformational change. So there are a whole series of things that can be done, keeping in mind that the ultimate solution is going to come from the Congolese people themselves. Our role on the outside is to make sure that we create the space for them to solve and address the challenges that they face. There's a strong desire for democracy in Congo, with leaders poised to start fixing their country. But key to their success is international pressure on Rwanda and Uganda to stop their destructive intervention. President Obama seems to understand this. For years, he has been an advocate for Congo, and as a senator, he co-sponsored a law that outlines a comprehensive strategy for Congo to realize justice. But key elements of this law have not been fully implemented. So, President Obama wrote a law to support the Congo, signing into law in 2006 by George Bush, the president then, co-sponsored by the Secretary of State today. That law is the most comprehensive law you can think about when it comes to supporting the Congo. And we have a law that says that the Secretary of State has the power to withhold aid to any nation deemed to be destabilizing the Congo if she has sufficient evidence that this country is doing so. We have so many evidence on Rwanda and Uganda, and we even have a leaked UN report that all the Secretary of State have to do is read it and say, okay, we are not going to support you. But since 2000, the United States have given Rwanda $1 billion. The leaked UN report is calling this government a genocidal government. Why is the United States supporting a genocidal government? And it doesn't have to be that way. You, don't, you do not have to slaughter millions of people to get access to the cobalt for your colored television, or access to the cobalt for your aerospace industry, or access to the copper for your automobile industry. All right, you're dealing with the economy. You want the coltan. Man, Congolese people don't eat coltan. Congolese people can't eat gold. Talk to the Congolese people, we're going to let you get the resources, but for God's sake, stop killing the people. Stop letting Rwanda, Uganda, and Joseph Kabila kill with impunity. The situation in the Congo is not just a Congolese issue. It's not just an African issue, but it's a global issue. It's a worldwide issue. Congo is a part of the second largest rainforest in the world. It's vital to the fight against climate change. If you're concerned about climate change, you should be concerned about Congo. Half of those who have died as a result of the conflict are children under the age of five. So if you're a child advocate, if you're concerned about children, you ought to be concerned about what's happening in the Congo. If you're concerned about women, if you have a mother, a sister, you ought to be concerned about what's happening in the Congo. If you drive an automobile, or fly an airplane, or own a cell phone, as a human being, at the very least, you ought to be concerned. You ought to say something. You ought to want to find out why this is happening. You ought to be moved to want to bring an end to it. Zambe, 
Bengan Zambe, a Pamela Biso, a Pamela Biso, Bengan Zambe, Bengan Zambe, Togo Bika, Togo Bika, Bengan Zambe. Eight out of ten people in Congo are unemployed and live on 30 cents or less per day. A Kinshasa, for Congolese children, the tragedy is endless. Massacred in their villages by machetes or recruited as child soldiers, hundreds of thousands of children are victims and many have become murderers. So as we look at what's taking place, the quickest way to end the conflict in the Congo is global pressure. We know that we have to get do a global education campaign. We want the American president not to look at Congo as a case of charity, but look at it in the prism of justice. Hold accountable all U.S. corporations plundering the resources of the Congo. So we know global pressure works. So what you can do in your community is to get the world leaders in your specific countries to also put global pressure on negative forces against the Congo so that the Congolese people can have a space to live in peace.